You know, the way the bracelet joins the case, that's really wide, the crown is very big. This integrated lock structure is also very tall and wide. Feels like they've turned almost everything up to 11. You know, like the indices are really huge, the hands are large, the crown again is quite big, and then these are surrounded with like the really petite details. The uh, the date window is squished together, the, uh, the sub-dial is quite small, you know, you can barely see it. The, the, the time for these chunky watches is sort of over. I really wish that we could see these, you know, the expertise of these brands shine through by making these a little bit more filigree, a little bit more refined and less of a tank on the wrist. Greetings and welcome to this week's A Blog to Watch Weekly. Good morning, Ariel. Hey, hey. Good morning, David. Good morning, everyone. And good morning from me. Yeah, I don't really say good morning, I suppose, do I? No, anyway, there we go. One of the one of life's great mysteries. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're all well. Whatever time you actually happen to be listening to this, we have a reasonably packed show. We're still waiting on Watch Ageddon or Arma Watch or whatever portmanteau it is that's due towards the end of this month. Ariel, are we seeing the deluge starting to appear in those NDAs from all those watch brands about what's coming? Um, is this related to the Aztec or Mayan calendar? What is Watch Apocalypse? <laughs> Watch Apocalypse 2023 every August in a, in advance of Geneva Watch Days and and everything. Yes, it does does sound a bit oh. mad. I suppose that Constant Shaken maybe have an annual calendar for Watch Apocalypse, like a some sort of complication that shows you when Dubai Watch Week is every two years, when Watches and Wonders is sometime in April kind of time, and then Geneva Watch Days. I do feel like it's a little bit early. I mean, this is very consistently in the last week of the month. I mean, the people are on vacation at most of the brands in Europe. They couldn't fathom sending out a press release at this time, least of which of all because they would have to, you know, answer emails as a response to it. So Be in the office, you know, there <laughs> we have. I'm saying like maybe like August 22nd or something like that. Around that time. That's when we're going to start to be, and it's going to be crazy. It's going to be like a Monday. I don't even, I haven't looked at the calendar, but it's going to be like big 10 releases. We're going to be like, <laughs> we're asking, we're asking ourselves all the questions. What does this mean? What does this mean? It, it won't mean anything. And then when David goes to Geneva, he'll be able to give us a bit of a sentiment report and put in, a we'll, we'll report. know what is on people's minds. There you go, David. That's what you're giving us a sentiment report. That sounds like a good good opening line. Here's my, it's like a weather forecast. Yeah. Here's David's sentiment report for the first day of Geneva watch days. I like the Whoa. sound of it. Yeah, sentiment forecast on Swiss watch industry. <laughs> Everything's very optimistic and fantastic. Luxury is looking up, up, up. Yes. <laughs> up it <-y. laughs> Okay. Excellent. Good stuff. Well, lots to get stuck into. Let's first of all get stuck into your Monday article, David. Grinding gears, recovering your stolen watch shouldn't be a hopeless dream. First of all, gentlemen, ever had a watch stolen? Me, thankfully not. Mm, David? No, thank God, no. And I haven't either, so we have absolutely zero experience for what we're about to speak about. But there we go. David, why did you write this article, first of all? What you've not you've 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 never suffered the crime. What made you think, I know what I'll do, I'll write about getting watches nicked. Well, I mean if you if you look online, it's been you know, watch theft has been rampant in some parts of the world. It's it's really crazy. I mean if we're we have multiple different videos of people getting mugged or robbed or, you know, at gunpoint often in, in various cities. And it, it's just for one, it's sad. And for two, you know, it led me to think about, you know, what are the chances of any of these people getting it back, getting their property back? And, you know, it's very slim. And I don't think watch brands and, you know, whatever else and, and the industry at large is doing, you know, nearly enough to make that process easier and for theft to be less of a, of an easy process and, and reselling especially, you know, so you steal it. Okay, that's one thing you have it. But you know, these stolen goods have to be flipped and sold, you know, really quickly. And it's really genuinely quite difficult to track. Let's say you're a customer and you, you know, you, you're in, you have goodwill and good faith and you go online and you shop around. Maybe you even pay full market value. It's not like a lot of these watches get sold. You know, eventually they, they get sold at full market value. It's not like you go online and you can buy a Daytona for 15000 and the next one for 30000 No, all of them are thirty, but some of them have been stolen and some others have not. 
Um, so yeah, there should be, you know, there's no such thing as a car vertical or something like that that exists in the world of cars where you can go online and check the serial number easily. Um, there are different databases, but you know, I'm not, I have not been given the impression that any one of these is DB all and end all. Uh, database that you can go to and check the uh, the serial number and be sure that you actually have the full picture on the history of the watch that you're looking to buy. So is the reason that this has not happened, that there isn't some master database that's, you know, it, it feels like a quite a Swiss thing to do. Like, let's organize a really big Excel spreadsheet that contains all the information in it. It's coming. Uh, so Richmond just set up it. I- inquirers, uh, or however they want to pronounce it, and it's meant to be that. Uh, how well that that's going to work, you know, we will see. Um, some other brands, like Breque, for example, has exactly that. Technically, a spreadsheet on their website, and you can just go online and then uh, visit that page. It's stolen timepieces, uh, you know, at Breque.com, and um, basically you can just scroll for ages and you have the different reference numbers and serial numbers next to them. And basically if you're looking at buying one of these watches, you can go online and basically hit control F or command F in your browser and search for the, ref- uh, for the serial number that you are looking at. Um, not very high end, but it is what it is. Um, I downloaded one of these, um, basically I was researching some statistics and I could find the Met Police uh, in London. Um, provide some some detailed information in as you requested a spreadsheet to somebody who who um, put out an inquiry on the number of watches and the value or the brand. I think it was the brand. Yes, the uh, the, the types of watch brands that are stolen more regular and more often than others. And basically, it turned out that half of them were basically Rolexes in a given period in London, and. Uh, you know, a lot of those watch names were misspelled or whatever else. And the point I'm trying to make is that I'm not <laughs> sure some, even the police, in, you know, in some instances can go online and, and, and have the resources to find these obscure pages on obscure watch brand websites and see if, you know, something has already been listed or, you know, if they confiscate watches, for example, or whatever. Uh, you know, how are these watches going to find their way back? And I think a reference database could be a good start for that. Which is which can be used by customers looking to buy a used watch or by the police or whoever else. Yeah, I think it is well worth going and having a look at this pie chart that you've put together from the Met's information. Yes. Because of how it relates to the actual quantity of these brands of watches that are out and about. So Rolex accounts through the police database for just under 50% of the watches stolen. But doesn't represent well how close is that to the percentage of luxury watches because i'm looking at a figure of 50 percent of watches stolen are rolexes but what percentage of watches that are luxury are actually rolexes about a third a bit bit less than than a third i think so the 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 figure that i can recall from the FHS was roughly three, three and a half million watches exported over 3,000 Swiss francs or something like that. Don't quote me on this, mm-hmm. but that's like a, a ballpark figure for you. And Rolex makes about okay. a million watches. So basically one in three luxury watches is a Rolex, you know, coming from Switzerland, but half of them were stolen. <laughs> yes, which suggests some knowledge yes. in the people stealing them. They know what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. Uh, because then you look at Audemars Piguet, which is on here at 4% mm-hmm. of the watches stolen. And presumably Audemars Piguet is like less than, I don't know, less than half a percent of the wa- luxury watches made. I mean, they only make 50,000 watches a year. Yeah. In, in terms of representative in the market, it must be tiny. Same with Richard Mille, 1.2% of the watches yeah. stolen. But exactly. must be in the, the 0.0 yes. in terms of the actual quantity. So there's clearly some intelligence mm-hmm. which suggests, as you indicate in the article, that there is actually a supply chain on the go here. And I think this is a thing that's not really yet been exposed. Is As you say, these watches are moving their way through so that eventually for want of a better way to put it, they have been washed. Except, obviously, your Omega Speedmasters, who are water-resistant. But the watches effectively have been laundered and then end up in the supply chain being sold alongside other watches that are going for whatever the used retail type thing is. Ariel, 
is there a, is there a, a middle bit of this story that really the industry is not really tackling? It's a very complicated issue. Um, you know, a large part of it is economics. How much money do you want to put into the problem? How much money is there to be saved? I would say that there's sort of two things that I think are interesting about this. Uh, one is the fact that a lot of times now, compared to at least historically, I think some criminals are actually stealing for themselves or right. not to turn the watch into cash, but to trade the cash. I'm sorry, the watch as cash for something else. So it, it, I think that one of the reasons why there's more of this is not just that watches are being sold into the market or pawned off, but that the watch itself now has currency value, um, which is interesting. And the second thought is related to the fact that it's very difficult to stop motivated criminals. You know, much of the fear, I think, is people having their watch stolen. Like, recovering it, I guess that's great, but people want to avoid the whole, you know, the whole problem of the violence and all that, right? Like, that's not good. And that's what people want to avoid. And that's a, that's a ch more challenging societal thing. It's not like society's great, but you know what? Watch thefts are up. Like, this is a a symptom of, uh, of a lot of issues and probably a lot of other uh, property crimes and thefts and, and things like that that are happening in the same places. And this reminds me of a conversation I had recently with a, a company here in, in America, um, Jewelers Mutual, which is an insurance company. And they have a product that's really specifically for insuring your personal watch. It doesn't actually cost that much. And when I was talking with them, there was something very important to me. I was like, okay, so you, bu you buy the insurance. Let's say worst, worst case scenario, your watch is stolen. Oh gosh, you want to file a claim. Then what? Are the people happy? They're like, oh my God, you're a great service. Thank you. You made my day. Or you're like, oh, and you're going to deny my claim after all this, you know, pushing, you know, pushing some more insult added to, added to injury. And he's like, no, 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 we really want to make sure people are happy. Um, we fulfill the claims. Um, really, the point is that there's a legitimate claim. We want people to feel like we, we've taken care of them. So I think maybe an answer here for people who are afraid is to look at some of the available types of insurance, like do your research. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's just a watch at the end of the day. If there's a motivated criminal and you have it insured, um, don't put yourself in harm's way for, for a timepiece. I know that like we're all men and we don't want anyone screwing with us. But, you know, I, I think that that is, is part of creating safety is in thinking outside the box a little bit and asking yourself, um, you know, is it so much a matter of saying, I never want anyone to steal my watch? Or rather, you know what, there are, there are assurances out there. And the, and the last thing I want to say relates to this database that you're talking about with David. I don't think the primary user is going to be the consumer. I actually think the insurance companies, law enforcement, whoever, they are the ones who should be making use of this database of uh, tracking these you know, high net worth stolen goods. Insurance companies, if this is successful, could actually translate into it decreasing the cost, right? If, if goods could be recovered, then watch insurance should cost less. Uh, and that's actually, you know, a, a positive thing. So I think there's a lot of merit to this, but I wouldn't just throw it on the consumer to be like, oh, and there's a database that might help you recover something. Like, I, I think most people want to put it behind them. It's such a horrible experience to have to think about if you've gone through that type of violence. Yeah, I just wonder to what extent there is a knowledge within some of the slightly less salubrious used watch retailers about, yeah, they, they kind of nod and wink. They know that stuff that's coming in is maybe not quite as legitimate L as it should be. Let me be ask you, do you have a lot of pawn shops on. in Scotland? No, it's the sort of thing we used to have. I can think of one in in okay well, Glasgow that is a, that is a traditional pawn shop there are there are a number of kind of those kind yeah, but they're they're chains so they have a different air of legitimacy because they're actually owned by a big organization okay, so they're more as like opposed consignment to being, stores <laughs> well, yes yeah exactly so i don't know about all of america but in los angeles much of the west coast especially places like las vegas the pawn shop is a popular kind of vestige of the culture. And right, okay. a lot of it is, okay, uh, I'm in a pinch, I'm in a bind, I need to sell some of my property for money. And a lot of it is also stolen goods, right? Mm -hmm. the, what I'm trying to say is the law and culture around 
the trafficking and resale of stolen goods is pretty well established. We figured all this stuff out before watches became a thing. I'm simply saying that I think that there's already a deep cultural awareness in the retailer environment of, you know, what types of goods are okay to accept, what the liability is for selling hot goods and things like that. Criminal liability sometimes, but much of the time you just forfeit any profit, right? Because if mm-hmm. you bought the good uh, and, and it's taken away from you from law enforcement or given back to the, the victim, ideally, you don't get your money back, right? So there's the risk of losing out. And if you knowingly receive stolen goods, then you, of course, could go to jail for a very, very, very long time. So there's, you know, a, a, a lot of, um, I think, well-established uh, criminal law in this area already. Mm-hmm. David, just a final thing on this. Uh, what these figures don't really reveal is how many of these were single crimes. Like, is the 1,400 Rolexes reported stolen? Is that one Rolex per wrist? Or did somebody get 50 Rolexes stolen out of their collection in one go? In other words, how really worried should we be about wearing the single luxury watch that we own out and about versus the fact that actually a lot of this, and I think a lot of this is driven by social media. I could go on social media right now and go, you know what? If we're trying to find out where that guy lives because he owns clearly owns hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of watches, if I was that way inclined. Yeah, it's a mix of both. Um, you know, it, it's been reported multiple times how celebrities and relatives of celebrities were robbed, you know, they had, uh, you know, they posted, oh, we are on holiday here and there, and that's when they go and, and you know, steal their things or break into their house and maybe even their safes or whatever else, and they know they have uh, a lot of time. So, yeah, that, but also just, you know, robberies in broad daylight sometimes on the streets, and sometimes uh, what happens is that, you know, these um, uh, groups use spotters, for example, in restaurants and elsewhere, and they spot you and they follow you home and they, you know, mug you basically on, on your doorstep. So um, it, it, it's a large variety of things. Thankfully, it's limited to, you know, a number of cities as far as I can understand that um, some of their places are completely safe. So it's not like the entire world is, is all about watch theft, but it's a thing. And uh, yeah, there's not much being done when it comes to uh, preventing it from happening and making it so damn easy to have these resold and um, money made out of this uh, uh, these uh, illegal activities. Yeah, so go on. I, I'd be interested to hear from people about their own experience of trying to get watches recovered. So if you've had a watch unfortunately stolen either by a personal attack, I suppose, regretfully, or, you know, a, a house or a, a robbery from a car or whatever, wherever you'd be, a gym, wherever you've been keeping your watch. I'd be interested to know about, did the brands give you any assistance in trying to recover or at least register the watch as having been stolen? What was the police's response? And it'd be interesting to know how that differs throughout the world, because I suspect possibly reporting this to the London branch of Rolex may be different than reporting it to the Dubai branch of Rolex or the Brazilian branch of Rolex. I think uh, it would be interesting to know if there's a different response from brands in different locations. But do go and check out David's article. Ariel is being published for those of you that... uh, Read, read Watch Pro, particularly Watch Pro USA. Ariel, you've written something. In America, relationships matter more than brands. Discuss. You already have. <laughs> Tell us more. So Rob Corder from Watch Pro, which is a business-to-business publication who we respect and we work with from time to time, wanted me to talk about the concept of relationships uh, in regard to retail and this dovetailed into something that I had been thinking about. Um, America now is the largest market for watches in the world, and it will be for some time. And that means that watch brands that haven't really developed the American market and who want to, you know, need to do some things to maybe avoid uh, some issues. And I think one of the most important things to me is to recognize how to work with retailers and customers here. And I begin with the premise that when it comes to sales success, the relationship a customer has with a retailer or that a retailer has with a brand is ultimately more important than, than brand desirability, meaning that 
uh, that relationship can can create an amp and, and add to brand desirability. Um, and without it, a great brand uh, isn't isn't going to get sold. So very important in America, especially compared to other countries that that I've seen personally, is that specific chemistry behind uh, the counter w- with the salesperson and the consumer. And you can, of course, you know, uh, translate that to a phone relationship or anything else that's remote. Uh, but the idea is that that relationship is of is what sells something and that person could be selling one of many different brands uh but because the relationship is strong they can they can make that sale happen it's not as though that that people call and be like i just want to buy this watch um i don't care who i'm talking to there are some of those watches okay there are some of those rolexes and things like that that for periods of time people just want it but most watches and most brands it's the relationship which matters more than the brand, which I think is a very interesting, um, different way of looking at it because in Europe, the way that they study is that brand desirability trumps everything and that people would, would ju- go through hoops to ju- own a desirable brand, which may be true in some places. But again, I think that in America, uh, the consumer has, um, again, uh, probably a very different uh, personality compared to in Europe. And is this part of the reason why the European brands, and I can think of one or two in particular, who seem to be very focused on having their own brand-owned boutiques, maybe a model that really doesn't wash long-term in the States because it's a different kind of selling experience because you're buying, if you like, from the brand rather than from the rather than from the salesperson who is the expert on whatever brand they happen to be selling, building that relationship. I mean, I want to sort of go with the devil's advocate argument and look at a company like Louis Vuitton. And Louis Vuitton is one of the few companies which has successfully, you know, created a large volume of brand stores, only Louis Vuitton, that's how we sell. Uh, yes, I guess the relationship is important. For the most part, it's the brand. They have such a powerful brand. But the interesting thing is that most of their income isn't derived from, uh, I guess you could say, traditionally rich people. It's from aspirational people who reach up to buy uh, a few hundred dollar, a few thousand dollar um, handbag, uh, not people who are spending, you know, the hundred thousand dollars or more, hundreds of thousands of dollars on the fancy Louis Vuitton timepiece. In America, the rich consumer, man, woman, I don't care who you are, uh, you you know that you have a lot of purchasing options, and you know that because there's so many ways to spend your money, you want to spend your money in a way that makes you feel good. That's what spending your disposable income is really all about in America. It's making you feel good. Um, and they want to spend it with people that make them feel positive. That's really w- what it is. So I think that there's... An, an importance of understanding what it is the customer is actually looking to buy. They're not looking to be part of a great maison. Uh, they're looking uh, for their ego to be validated. Um, and if a, you know, a purchase experience doesn't lead to that, it's going to be avoided. David, you're obviously based in Europe, but lots of experience in the States. Can you recognize the difference in retail experience between a European model and an American model? Well, I mean, it's interesting because in, here in Europe, I think we are, we, you know, we have a big appetite for some things American, you know, movies, food, um, pop culture, fast fashion, a number of things, you know, we, we love to import here. And I think, you know, some of what Ariel is describing, I'm sure, could eventually fly here as well. Um, you know, you know, people, you know, have, of course, egos, whether that comes from, I think there are two things here. One is, sure, you know, one, one, one thing is... Uh, me feeling good about the purchase, about the environment where I make that purchase. And then the other one, as Ariel said, is, 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 you know, just feeding the ego and saying, you know, okay, I have this brand, I'm part of this now, I can afford this, I have the status, etc. So uh, I see some simi- similarities. I, uh, but again, I think, you know, this could be a continuation where here in Europe, we um, continue to consume in the ways that we learn from America. Well, Give us your opinion. Uh, you need to go to Watch Pro. I don't even know if you can leave comments on Watch Pro or not, Rob. You need to figure out. Can you leave comments on Watch Pro? I think you've posted think this so. on LinkedIn, haven't you? Yeah, there was a, quite a discussion on LinkedIn where you know I shared this to the community a little bit. So if you're on LinkedIn, go and track down Ariel, myself, David, and join that conversation. Let's review some watches. 
first up then Ariel this is a hands on I think that you did watch review of the Zenith Defy Skyline 41mm black ceramic yep cool watch what do we think what do we th- well there you go uh, let's move on to the next watch then it's a uh, <laughs> cool watch there you go uh, what, it's straightforward uh, what do we think of the Skyline range from Zenith look I, what I like about it is that it's it's weird uh, they could have made a super conservative watch that's sort of um, you know a Me Too integrated bracelet watch they didn't they added like Zenith weirdness to it <laughs> and that makes it more niche and a little bit stranger but it holds your attention more and I like that Zenith is doing that because for a long time, Zenith had two kinds of watches, like very traditional, you, you mm. know, you know, or maybe I don't want to say look alike, but it's like falling into a desired market segment. We'll call it that. And then they had like stuff which is like, wow, I'm really glad you're being different. I don't know what you were thinking, but that's that's really that's really something, Zenith. Um, <laughs> and and now we're starting to see a little bit of a merger between the two, where they have things that exist within market demand segments but just aren't trying to be another product and this one has a movement that has a hand on there that moves quickly and other than moving quickly it only makes sense for you if you need to see a hand that goes around the dial once every 10 seconds if this is something that you need you know this is definitely a feature for you uh, but it doesn't have a running seconds hand it just has this very fast seconds hand and that's there to remind you that it has a five hertz movement inside, which again, all about more precise reading of the time, no seconds hand, kind of ironic. Maybe they should have had two of these subdials on the dial, make it a little bit more symmetrical and have one going at 60 seconds, one at 10. That would have been interesting. <laughs> I don't know if they tried that and that was too much. Uh, maybe, maybe they Maybe ticking the opposite direction just to look like some sort of Constantine Ooh, shape. Ooh, there you go. You could, yeah, you could have some crazy, you know, thing like that. <laughs> crazy eyes. Uh, <laughs> uh, but no, um, it's it's an integrated bracelet watch with a great system where you can swap the bracelet out with a strap and it comes with both. You don't have to buy them both. It comes with both. And the strap is comfortable. It has a deployance rubber. And it's really easy to change them, to be honest. And I've worn the metal version. The ceramic version is a lot more. I can understand why. The bracelet has a lot of parts and they need to be cut very very finely. I can see a high breakage rate. The number of watches they make, which are ceramic compared to steel, has got to, got to be a lot less. Um, it is, is it the most expensive ceramic watch on the market? No. Probably some <laughs> Audemars Piguet is way more. Um, is it the cheapest? No. It isn't. You know, even at LVMH, uh, uh, there's less expensive, you know, all ceramic watches and things like that. So you have, you, you know, you have an interesting product, but it, it is genuinely cool. So it's sort of difficult from a sales perspective to be like, here's the key features of this watch. But when you wear it, it's sort of an emotional, emotional thing. And so what we have here is Zenith at its, uh, you know, Zenith of enthusiast f- focus. Uh, because it's not always an enthusiast brand. Sometimes it's, you know, the, the, the Chronomaster Sport, uh, again, has sort of a look and feel of a Daytona. Awesome watch. But it's a mainstream watch. It's, it's, it's anyone can enjoy it. Something like the, the Defy Skyline, you got to be a little bit of a watch nerd to even get it. And I think that's why, again, it's enjoyable in, in, in a conversational way. David, does this what I, f- I mean, I really, I do like the Skyline, but when I see it in photos, there's something that just doesn't look quite right proportions wise. Mm-hmm. And I've never been able to quite put my finger on what it is. Yeah. But when I try it on, it does wear very well. Is what is it? Can you tell what it is I'm seeing? Yeah. <laughs> that makes me think the proportions are not quite right. Yeah, I think it's it's a bit chunky to my eyes in some details. So you know, on 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 one end, it's you know, it it, it has beautiful details, polished ceramic, and all the rest of it. You know, it, it's really neat. But some of the stuff on it just ended up being quite chunky. You know, the way the bracelet joins the case, that's really wide. The crown is very big. This integrated lock structure is also very tall and wide. Uh, the case profile is very tall. It's just a, a rather thick watch. And, they, you know, it feels like they've turned almost everything up to 11. You know, like the indices are really, you know, like huge. The hands are large. The crown, again, is, is, is quite big. And then these are surrounded with, like, 
the really petite details. Uh, the the date window is squished together. Uh, the uh, the sub dial is quite small, and the ten on it, you know, you can barely see it. The dial uh, decoration, you know, again, is a, is a bit small and disproportionate. It's, it's, it, the proportions are just not quite right. The execution is great in the sense that it looks like a quality product. And again, they've, they've really mastered whoever this, their supplier is, you know, how to work with ceramic. It's really up there. Uh, so it's a beautiful product. But the proportions, I think, you know, I think the, 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 the time for these chunky watches is sort of over. I really wish that we could see these, you know, the expertise of these brands shine through uh, by making these a little bit more filigree, a little bit more refined and less of a tank on the wrist. Ariel, do you notice these things when you're actually wearing it and moving it around? Or is it just the fact that we're looking at a stationary photo that draws our eyes to some of the things that maybe don't quite tie together? It's not, but- it's not perfect. It, look, it, David's correct where when you wear it on the wrist... The overall sensation is is one which is positive. It's a quality watch. It's made well. It does all the things necessary. It's legible. It's not falling off the wrist or anything like that. So it has all the watch things. Once you look at the details, you're like, yeah, case could be you know thinner. Uh, the dial could have this moved over here, or why is this over here? Like, there's always been refinement things. Like Zenith has never been a brand that like hyper focuses on like dial perfection. They just they're, that's not Zenith. It's never been them. It's not again where 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 we see most of their uh, most of their attention to detail. So this is about what I expect. Once in a while they get it better than others, uh, but this this falls in line with what you know with, with Zenith Dial. So for me, it's not like shocking. Um, what I do hope is that if they like this collection, they continue to tweak it, and that's the positive side. So even though sometimes they come out with stuff quickly, they're also not too uh, hesitant about changing things, tweaking things, adapting things. And I think that that's a positive thing. So I think that there's a lot to, to work with here. Um, I think the Defy Skyline is a cool collection overall. My hope is that they continue to invest in it rather than be like, oh, it's not perfect. Let's move on to something else. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you've got the Chronomaster Sport, which is clearly quite related to the Daytona, but somehow manages to retain its own identity. And you've got this that has distinct feelings of AP, yet still manages to retain its identity. And yeah, I think it'll be good to see this range developing and and being tweaked and uh, improving as time goes on. But go and leave us your comments at ablogtowatch.com. Hi, I'm Ariel Adams, founder of A Blog to Watch with a message from eBay, a platform I probably use daily. Make sure your watches are the real deal with eBay Authenticity Guarantee. I believe it's the first and best service of its kind that protects your luxury purchases and checks each watch individually at eBay's highly reputable authentication partner, Stolen Company, in the United States. From band to bezel, their authenticators ensure each wristwatch matches the eBay listing and is the real deal. Authenticity guarantee is also very fast. Once authentication is complete, your watch is securely delivered via rapid two-day shipping. Surprisingly, eBay's authenticity guarantee service is free for all watches priced $2,000 and up. No one should buy a luxury item without an authenticity guarantee. Do what I do and check eBay before each watch purchase because everyone deserves real. David, Porsche Design. You have reviewed a watch from Porsche Design. Tell me why we as watch nerds should pay attention to Porsche Design as a watch brand. Uh, I think, you know, what's interesting here is that this is technically, uh, I hope I'm not making a fool out of myself, but this is the only watch brand that is actually closely associated with a car brand. Um, we've seen nice, you know, nicely done, nicely performed collaborations. You blow with Ferrari springs to mind. They have really made the most of that collaboration. They've worked with the design team there. They've used certain design elements and incorporated them into their Hublot watch designs. But here is a company that is actually through a very complicated structure of different companies and um, uh, conglomerates is actually linked to Porsche, uh, the car company, and it was uh, it was set up by uh, Ferdinand. So it's uh, 
it's something Fer Fernand Alexander Porsche. So, you know, it's it's something that is inherently linked to the history of Porsche and to the Porsche family. And of course, through design, it's also linked to, uh, to the various cars by now at long last, because I think it started in 2015, 2016, when they first launched one of these um, Turbo S um, um, models, you know, like the special editions that finally had a watch that would go with the car and be linked to the specific design elements of that car and before that you know we could see you know you had to like squint a little bit and then you could see various different elements from like tachometers and other stuff from porsche cars but now there's a very definite link and collaboration between the two companies and uh you know it's been it's been uh, long overdue but it's happening now so i think the reason why i would care is to see how you know uh, a, a watch company operates when it has a link to one of the greatest car uh, manufacturers of all time and looking at this particular release which is the uh, porsche design chronograph one 911 st um you know which is linked to the car that was launched for the 60th anniversary of the 911 you can see that working out i think it's it's one of the great in, uh, incorporations of a tachometer design into a watch the color scheme also matches one of the tachometer designs the heritage one from porsche so it's a cool looking watch and yet it may it remains a good watch it's a decent watch you can read it it's legible it's not a mess it's not quirky it's just something that has various elements from porsche and striking that balance of you know keeping a watch being just that a functional and you know nicely made a timepiece and having a legitimate link to a car is very difficult. And finally, Porsche design is getting the hang of it, apparently. Yeah. I got a comment so, here, too. Yeah, go for it. Because I, I have some thoughts, but I'm not sure necessarily how to get them onto the audio <laughs> airwaves. So, Ariel, you go first while I try to gather I'm, my thinking about I'm this watch. I'm a huge traditional fan of Porsche design, from when others were making their watches to whatever they're doing now. Um, in terms of, you know, manufacturer, not all their watches have been great, but, you know, David can tell you for years, we would always eagerly go to their booth at Basel World, um, a blog to watch covered, <laughs> covered Porsche design, I think more enthusiastically than, than anyone else. Um, and we did events together and things like that. More recently, they changed focus. They, they really restricted a lot of media activities. And part of the problem was they weren't, doing as well as they want to do with watch sales uh even though they had these great stores and great watches they just you know they were kind of marketing them now they've done something which and, and david correct me if i'm wrong here but a lot of their watches can only be purchased if you buy the cars so they've sort of changed this exclusivity paradigm where they try to say like but this is only available to the select few mm. these watches are great but they're very expensive uh, I mean, they're they're about double the price of what they were uh, not too long ago for the same watch. Uh, so I like them. Good designs. You know, Porsche designed one of the best titanium watches. I mean, oh, my God, this company did amazing titanium. But now, it you know, this is a $13,500 watch, uh, you know, and it's it's, it's a lot of it's a lot of money. You know, and, and again, I don't know that that's where this de this design concept was never intended to be sold for this much money, even even adjusted for inflation. <laughs> so I think they have a very sort of strange business model now with how they sell a lot of these. Um, we love them. Uh, they are very, very cool. And it's hard to deny the very legitimate heritage that Porsche Design has in horology. Uh, but their current business model kind of rubs me the wrong way. And I don't really know exactly where they go with this. This seems to be sort of a temporary solution. Yeah. So I'm wearing some Porsche design glasses, some reading glasses or distance glasses, whatever way around they are. And when I see these glasses in the store, I go, oh, I really like the look of those glasses. Hmm. And then I pick them up and I see that it says Porsche design on the side. And then I have to go through the process of thinking, what does this say? Because it's pretty obvious it says Porsche's on the side. We're, we're not hiding the fact that I've got a car brand written on the side of my glasses. So I then need to go through the process of thinking, well, what is that communicating to people who see me with a German car brand on the side of my head? And that's where I am struggling now to communicate, which is really useful for a podcaster. But 
<laughs> I've got to go through the process of is this is this saying that I aspire to drive a Porsche, and we all know that car brands have this kind of things they say about people. Mm. You know, yes. Back in the day, if you drove drove a BMW, you were something. Nowadays, it's probably been replaced by if you drive an Audi. I happen to have just sold my Audi, so I'm no longer in that uh, uh, category. And people who associate themselves with car brands, you know, I, I'm a big Volvo driver, love Volvos, and I know that that says something about me. Or at least it, it's maybe not true what it says, but because it's a, a, a really easy thing for people to say and make a judgment call without having met your spent any time with you, then that's what folk do. They put folk in boxes. You drive a you drive a Range Rover. You're you know uh, you're on the school run and you you know Chelsea tractor and all these. So sort of I'm things. trying to or, figure out what does wearing Porsche design glasses say about you? Well, this is this is my question. This is my question. So. Uh, maybe it's a British thing. Maybe it's a Scott. Maybe it's just a me thing. Who knows? But I'm going through the process of going. Does me having the phrase Porsche on the side of my head communicate something about me to people that I don't wish to communicate? E.g., you really want to own a Porsche. You think you deserve to own a Porsche, or you can't really afford a Porsche, so you bought the glasses. So why did you and buy I think it? This is where the Rick. Well, I bought the glasses because I liked the glasses okay. and I was able to get over the fact that it said Porsche on the side. Mm. But I could imagine back in the day have gone, I really don't want to have Porsche written on the side of my head. I'd rather have something that was nondescript or that nobody had ever heard of. How do you feel about okay. John Deere? Would you wear John Deere glasses? <laughs> now, are you saying that because my avatar on Zoom as we speak, I happen to be wearing a John Deere These baseball These are two cap. known vehicle <laughs> brands. And uh, one of them, you're very point. conspicuous about wearing their glasses. The well, other, you're probably wearing on a hat. I just want to know where you draw the line. Well, uh, the, the the photograph that you happen to be looking at on this Zoom call, those are the very Porsche design glasses. So They're I have very balanced handsome, my sir. John. I have balanced my John Deere baseball cap with my Porsche design glasses, and I, I'm quite happy. But with I that. don't. They don't have like the giant <laughs> Porsche Shield logo coming out of them. Like I don't know that I'm no. like Porsche design man. <laughs> but this is where I think the watch and what you've just said about the fact that to get the watch you now have to own the car it changes what this means okay you're right and they literally are restricting it I think it's a sales technique because they're trying to make people feel like it's more important than it is yeah because I really like Porsche design watches the 1919 UTC I think is a spectacularly good watch yeah it's cool they're, they're all completely overpriced, but that's a different conversation. I, I think this is this particular watch is just getting slightly too close to the... I don't even know what the, the right phrase is, but you, it, it's, there's an episode of Friends where... Actually, that's it. There's an episode of Friends where Joey and Chandler pretend to own a Porsche... Yes. And it's basically a bunch of cardboard boxes with a cover thrown over the top of it. Is it a Porsche or Ferrari? I can't remember. With a cover thrown over the top of it in the street. And he goes and he buys the gloves and the jacket and presumably the watch and the shoes and tries to complete the outfit when all along it's just a bunch of cardboard boxes under a cover and eventually falls through, Pratt falls through all and reveals the truth. So the Porsche guy took his car back. But you found the keys to his clothes? <laughs> no, I just, uh, I just love the way it feels when everybody thinks I own a Porsche. And people would think you own a Porsche because you're wearing the clothes? Of course. <laughs> Only an idiot would wear this stuff if you didn't have the car. <laughs> that is true. And I think this watch just comes a bit too close to the you're overcompensating. But now now Porsche has the most incredibly obnoxious retort is, well, sir, you're not even allowed to buy one anyways. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I'm con this yeah, this this challenges me, this watch. I, I actually really quite like it. I could do without the gear knob thing on it. I think that's just 
why. Uh, I think the one thing that post design have always been good at <laughs> is understating. Like you say about the glasses, it doesn't have the shield. It just says post design. It doesn't lean. It leans I'm going to tell you why it's on the dial. Far. You want to know why right, that's okay. on the dial? Yeah. They no longer print it on the gear shifts anymore because manual is so, they're so rare. So now you need a small <laughs> reminder where the gears are. That's really the issue. Yeah, just think 20 years from now, people will be looking at it going, what is that? What's, <laughs> what's one to six as they're going through their 19 speed Ah, then PDK it's like, oh, grandson, gearbox. let me tell you a story about something we call <laughs> driving a car. <laughs> yeah, anyway, there we go. So I'm really interested to know what everybody else thinks of this post sign. Uh, but yeah, so there you go. Go check it out. Right, we are going to, because we spent far too long on that, we're just going to move straight on to a hit miss maybe for a few watches I'm that we're not going to be able to I'm thinking Deere Design. Get. You like the sound of that? Deere Design? I think John, John Deere should get into making watches, little tractor logos on it. That's fine by me. It Caterpillar did be, it. Caterpillar made watches for a while. Well, yeah, I mean, the reality is I've got a John Deere hat, but that was bought for me from the... I think, did John Deere have a factory in Nashville? Uh, or is it just that the it's, wrong person. Is it, is it just that it's tractor country? Anyway, it was a hat brought back from me from Nashville. Personally, I'm a... I, I, and here's here's a little contradiction you JCB for you. JCB man? Well, no, I'm a Lamborghini man. Okay. But Lamborghini tractors, me and we Jeremy know, Clarkson... We know, we know. Strong bond, strong bond, mean mean big Jezza. I also have a class tractor, but that's a different story. But yeah, back in the day when Lamborghini made decent tractors, that's the kind of tractor. But anyway, right, enough of that nonsense. We can tune into a blog to tractor sometime soon. Hit miss maybe. We'll do a few of these because we've got a bit of time to briefly go through. Ariel, you did a hands-on review of the HYT Moonrunner Supernova Blue Watch. Let's hit miss maybe this. So, David, hit miss maybe on the HYT? Oh, geez. Um, I guess it's a miss for me. There's just too much going on. It's 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 just weird. It's weird for my eyes. Ariel, weird for your eyes. You've handled it. Hit miss maybe. There's a lot to like about this. Um, I'm gonna say maybe. Uh, mainly because HYT is the type of brand that needs a lot of energy behind it. They've gone through uh, a whole lot of different ownership (laughs) recently. And Uh, I'm just trying to determine what is next for them. So this is the best modern watch they've made so far in terms of the modern crop of stuff. Uh, and, and it and it's cool. Uh, it, it's it's got an interesting calendar system, and it's definitely neat looking. It's not cheap, but maybe in terms of like, are they going to further refine it? What's coming next? Um, and I'm not really clear what's necessarily going with HYT. So I, I'm open minded yeah. and optimistic, but um, this is a watch that no one but them can fix. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I think it's a move for me because I think you're right. I think this is. We're in the real pivot point. Does HYT have a future? They need an actual bona fide hit. I'm not sure this is it. They need something simpler that nobody reports as having broken down or even a fix or whatever. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, let's see how it gets on. No doubt we'll hear from them quite a bit next year. Vulcan Cricket Nautical Dive Watch. We have both spoken to Guillaume recently, Ariel and myself, on various interviews. But Ariel, is this latest from Vulcan a hit? So, I mean, there is a there is a market for this dial. It's not my favorite dial. I've never really liked this look, but this watch with this kind of dial has been made for a long time and people like it. Um, no one else is making it right now, and Vulcan is, you know, they're the ones to do it. Um, the Vulcan Cricket is an alarm watch. It's a mechanical alarm, and, um, you know, Vulcan is not the only one doing it. Jugere has mechanical alarms with the memo boxes and stuff like that. I'm trying to see here what the price is, because my guess is that um, these are probably... Just the, under five grand. Yeah, this is, you know, this is the, the lesser expensive. Maybe they could go even lower in price. So... You know, if, if you don't like this dial, that's fine. But if you want a mechanical alarm and you want to buy a new watch, uh, the Vulcans of today are less expensive than they were a little while ago. They still have, I think, most of the movements have, uh, were made a while ago. So these are actually meant for uh, some very, being in high, even higher end watches. 
in a few years they'll have to make new movements and it's unclear exactly uh what what route they'll take but i actually think right now is a good time to buy a volcan yep david i think this is meant to be a snappy session so i would just uh, say it's a hit for me <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i think it's i'm a big fan of volcane i've got a couple of them big fan of alarm complications needs to be more of them <sighs> I'm still leaning a little bit into a maybe for this just because of the strap. There needs to be something different, not this kind of leatherette, whatever it is. But do really like these, so I think I'll give it a give it a, a maybe leaning towards a hit. Okay, well, wow, it's an easy change strap. It comes with two, yeah, and you true. could supply your own. True. That really pushed you over the edge to maybe. Wow, tough customer. Yeah, here. yeah, tough customer, tough yeah, customer. Five yeah. grand is not cheap for you don't think guillaume will give you the strap of your choice he'd be a nice guy Uh, if guillaume gives me the watch of my choice i'll turn it into him Uh, my opinion is available to be bought at least i admit it i have a c4 4 very popular micro brand david hit for me for sure love the yellow very cool ariel immediate reaction i feel like if you said the word c4 like five times quickly your mouth would gum up (laughs) <laughs> like just say that in your head or out loud five times see fourth it's gonna be very difficult for you <laughs> uh, and does that make it a maybe or a miss for you then uh it's it's fine i don't feel like this company has gone materially ahead in the last several years they just sort of stopped at a particular place they're fine i i i i think what he's done is is nice they're they're pretty watches but there's so much other stuff that fits the exact same niche for me i'd say maybe like if you gave it to me i'd be happy but like i, I i'm not I'm not like, wow, they're doing something really new over here. Yeah, I think that'd be my opinion. It's a maybe, just not quite pushing forward the way that maybe they once were the darling of the micro brand. Feel them might be getting a little bit stuck in a rut. So it'd be really interesting to see something, you know, properly brand new and, and innovative from them. So a maybe from me, Bell and Ross green watches green steel i really like this this is a hit from me just love it i don't know what it is just about bell and ross watches just now just really ticking a box don't own one but if i did this would be a hit ariel it's a hit for me too odd thing about the chronograph i wore not the green dial which is lovely but a different version on a strap and I was like, oh, is the watch going to be as cool on the strap as a bracelet? In a lot of ways, I actually liked it more. It was super comfortable. And the strap allowed the shape of the case to be a little bit more emphasized. And it looked especially nice with the chronograph version, just the case thickness and the dial and stuff like that. So you're right. It's like it's not remarkable. It doesn't feel like there's rocket science here, but it just it feels really satisfying. It's just coming together as a thing right now. Maybe it's just the zeitgeist wear watches and something that's a little bit different david it's a miss for me um you know i should be consistent and i am because it, it just makes me feel the same way as the senate does it's too chunky and if i were to go balandross i would go all the way and i would just get a br03 and be done with it uh, uh-huh. but i appreciate that they are refining <laughs> their original concept it's more rounded it's uh, it's more refined in some ways so yeah i can certainly see that development and and i applaud it but it's just still, it's a narrow bracelet. It's a big watch head. Um, it's just a lot going on. There's And, and there's the new BR3, uh, the BR3A. So David, you have you have that available for you. Yay. Sign me up. <laughs> okay. And finally for today, leaving the big boy to last, Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter 75th anniversary summer blue watch. An anniversary too far, or I don't even know what it's an anniversary for. You know, I shot this watch. It's pretty. You know, Omega's done a lot of color stories. You know, and so has Rolex. And the thing which is, which I, I again I love, but Omega's not going to love me for saying it, is that some of them work great, like here, and some of them are terrible. Like they have those, um, I think they're Aquaterra models with the sort of uh, colorful dials, and they all look cheap. They're, the watches aren't made cheap, but the dials, like we've seen these, like you know. They look like analyzed aluminum dials. They're just not that special looking. Um, And so I guess they're experimenting. And this one came out nicely. And it's great when they make the same design, like in that all black look. Uh, So I think it goes to the power of the Seamaster 300M design. Um, And, you know, but let's just, but again, it's, it's hit and miss. Like some of these, like 
You should you should see the colors in person before you get excited. Let's put it that way. So uh, maybe then if it's no, it's a, a hit. hit this miss, is a hit. I'm just a hit. saying, Omega you you know, a hit? Does, doesn't always get it right in these color stories, as they call it. Right. For me, this is a miss. I I just can never get round how the straps look in these. I always feel it just looks too narrow. Like the lug width could do with being slightly bigger. The the straps just seem weird. The proportion just never seems right to me. I don't know why. Because they're fundamentally good watches and nice watches, but it just, maybe it's just the photographs. I think it's the photo. It has a bit of a different (sighs) look, but I think it sells Mm -hmm. itself. And here's the thing. The Seamaster 300M case, in my opinion, is prettier off the bracelet than on the bracelet. So wearing it on the strap is the best way of doing it, but the best way is wearing it on one of Omega's NATO straps. So that would be an improvement. David... Final hit miss maybe for you. Give us the full full double barrels on this Omega. Uh sorry, I just got lost on Bandros looking at BRO threes. <laughs> 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 I, I, I quite like this multimeter Davis. one. I might have to ask one for review. That's very cool. Uh <laughs> in all seriousness, I think it's <laughs> it's a cool anniversary piece for sure. Uh, I, I wish they had gone they had done a little bit more to make it, you know, thinner. And again, more refined. I mean, it's been 75 years and uh, it's 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 about time some of these brands started making these watches smaller. Like what you're saying, basically the strap width is just right, but the watch head is large. And, you know, we've seen this over the years, over the last 10, 15 years. Oh, we just added a millimeter here and then two more there. And then what we ended up with are some of these bloated watches. Like I look at some of these cases and with my mind's eye, I can see... A, it's not a small movement, but a relatively small movement. Like you don't need that much case around that movement. Uh, so hopefully we'll see that happen. And, you know, this, this, uh, this trend continue uh, to shift away from these bloated watches into something more refined. Yeah, you know, I have to say something. I, I respect what David's saying that there are a lot of these watches. If you like a smaller proportions, they just all look too big. But I feel like when someone who wants a smaller watch talks about bigger watches, there's like a lot of judgment. They say things like bloated, like the big watch should lose weight. Like no one who's like, <laughs> like larger watches say that about like, oh, the tiny little baby watch. Like we don't say that. They're like, okay, it's 35 millimeters. Like if you want to wear that, that's fine. <laughs> like I don't understand why the, the small watch crowd has to make <laughs> the other side feel no, so bad I'm about quite it. Happy to, I'm quite happy to judge all these small <laughs> small watch wearer types. I'm, it's just like, I'm, not, it's like, I'm not saying all large watches are bloated. I'm saying this is bloated because it has a tiny strap and, you know, a not that wide movement and then a big fat case around it. <laughs> you know, that's what makes it bloated in my eyes. But I, I, mean, I do like is, a chunky watch yeah. every once in a while. I, I, I get it. I'm just musing on the way that we sometimes talk about the watches that we don't want to be wearing and like, how dare they exist? Yeah. Well, I was going to, I was going to make that the end finally, but I too am now on the Bell and Ross website having a look. So David, I think we need to do a group test, like one of those top gear things whereby we all get one. Okay. So what I'll have like one of the BRO3 GMTs cause they, they're stunning watches. What one are you after them sending you? I think it's a good idea. Yeah, I think I think that sounds good. I'm I'm down for this multimeter. So, BR0394 multimeter. You can't read it, but it's fun. That's what I like. Okay. Excellent. And Ariel, what's your choice from the website? And we'll 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 email we'll email Carlos. <laughs> oh my god. I mean I would I I know that I like the the BR um five a lot already but i feel the new br3 is what i want to check out for a while I'll get a little bit of return to the classic square because i'm just like so into square watches right now good stuff well let's uh let's write off to them straight after this recording and see if we can all get a load of a watch for a group test on the podcast excellent right gentlemen what are you up to for the remainder of the week david What's coming in for review? What have you got coming? Uh, I have a Frederick Constant Tourbillon in for review that I was looking forward to Ooh. receiving. So that's kind of cool. Uh, and I'm nailing down meetings for Geneva Watch Days. It's going to be a busy week. Good stuff. And Ario, what are you up to? In a week, uh, myself and Ed from the Blog to Watch team will be going with Luminox to the uh, Utah desert uh, for the, a trip. It was part of a and giveaway. Only one of you is coming back. Only one of us is coming back. No, <laughs> well, this is a safe, civilized place for the most part. Uh, good watch wearing territory. Territory. Great uh, stargazing at night. 
Um, that's a brand we like doing a lot of stuff with. And something that we're doing at Oblige to Watch, which is fun, is we're trying to come up with a new uh, slogan statement. And then we're going to put it on the header. And it's been really interesting. Obviously, you guys have been part of the discussion. But um, trying to figure out that one statement that works. Or maybe we should have like five of them and they just alternate. You know, they just <laughs> randomly appear. <laughs> I, uh, different I slogans. Think we, we, I think we ask the audience. Audience, send us your new slogans for the blog to watch. I think just Well, they should know what we're all... trying to go for. You know, they, we yeah. should just say random slogan. <laughs> we'll get <laughs> we any just number type... of things. Exactly. You should just have like a box on the website that people can type in their slogan. Well, and, this you know, is what for we were told. Day. We were told, <laughs> make it clear to people you're not a watch store. Yeah. Make it clear to people that, uh, you know, the advertising is conspicuous. Um, mm-hmm. uh, some of the team members like the term unbiased, but I say, no, we have bias. We're just like transparent with who they are and open and, and clear <laughs> and you can come to your own conclusion. Uh, you know, we we advocate for the hobby as opposed to buying any specific watch or brand or something like that. You know, we really want people to make their own decisions about things. Um, people didn't feel like the word independent media meant meant that much anymore, and I, I'm sure I'm not really clear what that is. People look down upon the the term blog these days. They feel like it, it's not as prestigious a thing as it was in 2007 when a blog to watch was created. I'm like, mm. well. It is in the name, so not really sure what to do about that. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, but this is, yeah, these are some of the discussions. So we want to have like a statement in the header when you go to the website, which is like, oh, those are our ads over there. The rest is our idea. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think just send us all the watches. Kind of, Mwahaha, send us all the watches. We so have a statement that says, send us all the watches, and then like <laughs> click here. <laughs> and right. form, click, submit click all the watches. Address. <laughs> Send us your watches. Yeah, that's okay. good. Uh, that's, uh, uh, maybe just, uh, maybe we could just identify something for each of the brands. Like, we know the IP addresses that the guys, for example, at Bell and Ross are logging on from. So when they log on, the website identifies their IP address and just pulls out all the really nice stories about Bell and Ross. What about things so like, they you send didn't us all really the want an Invicta. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no Invictus here. No Invictus, please. Or yeah, maybe maybe we need to state what we're against. Uh, rather Rolex? Than what we're question for. mark. How about Tag Heuer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, good. Go. Uh, yes. We so, need to get an AI uh, on this. I, I think just a daily change, like changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace every day. The the strat line just mysteriously changes. The the, the AI just has a think about it. I would love uh, that. I would love that. You know what I had for many years was uh, something that I liked a lot. It, I th- I saw it on another website. I thought it was brilliant. Um, they, they, there was a lot of clocks, right? Mm-hmm. But I said I don't want a regular clock. I want a clock that you read out the time. So I had mm-hmm. someone design. Uh, and we, we, we've since taken it out, but it said in like in le- in like letters, like the time is like, you know, three fifty seven. Yeah. So I just thought that was such a cool thing because it was a you know it was a blog it was a blog and you read it, but it's about time. So a text based clock. I just I thought that was so cool. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to apologize. It's absolutely fine. I mean, I just I'd never seen in a header. I'd seen them in like actual clocks and things like that that people maybe yeah, like on a website too. I've yeah, never seen it before. clock or what it was called. Yeah, cool. Good. Well, if you've got ideas as to how you think we should be describing Slogans. ourselves, you are you are the listening and the reading audience. So it's kind of designed to appeal to you. Because if you don't you tell us we're going with like send you. us your watches. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Well, no, you That's need the, the mwah. Do you, the, laugh, the... the laugh words, the mwah, M-U-A-H, <laughs> yeah, yeah. like that. Mwah, okay. <laughs> send us all your watches. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, thank you for joining us. Join us again next week. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Catch you guys next week. Bye-bye.